teaching, and growing together through the Bible. This is Hope of Glory with Pastor Mark Barrett. Uh, We're in chapter 7 today, and if you take your Bibles and turn there with me, there's an old saying first uttered by the ancient philosopher Plato, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I bet you didn't know it went that far back, did you? But there's another saying that's equally true, which is that truth is often in the ear of the listener. And the reason is that words mean different things to different people. Okay, let me just give you some examples of that. For for example, the word trunk. Well, trunk means one thing to a botanist. Trunk means another thing to an elephant trainer. And something entirely different to a professional mover. Here, let me grab that trunk for you. (laughs) Or or how about the word uh, throwing a ball? Uh, In the sports page of your newspaper, does anybody read a newspaper anymore? Wherever you find your news in the sports page, um, throwing the ball has a certain meaning. And yet, if you were to flip over to to the society page, it means something different entirely. Um, so-and-so threw a ball this weekend. Oh, or how about the word boot? Have you thought about that word? To the laborer, it means one thing. It's something that you wear on your feet. Um, it might mean something different to the person who has just gotten fired from a job. They got the boot. Over in England, a boot is the trunk of your car. Different meanings for the same word. Now in the book of Hebrews, this is the kind of thing that we're facing. Uh, It's a book that many believe is one of the most difficult books in the Bible to interpret. And one of the reasons is because of passages like this in chapter 7, verses 1 to 19, that we're looking at today. And the reason that it's so difficult for us to interpret this book is because, well, we were born, uh, you know, in this century, and the book was written in the first century, and it was written to Jewish people who had traditions, and they had the law, and they were, uh, they had the temple ceremony, and and now, all these years later, uh, we Uh, primarily who are Gentiles, are reading this book without a lot of understanding of Jewish law, Jewish traditions, the priesthood, uh, the temple worship, all the ceremonies. Uh, I mean, we can barely pronounce the word Melchizedek, you know. (laughs) So today, we want to try to bridge the gap and introduce our modern generation into the thinking of the ancient day Melchizedek. Now before we do that, we we need to do a little bit of a review. Maybe you haven't heard previous messages. Uh, You can go back uh, on YouTube and you can watch some of those to catch up. Let me just do a little bit of a review for you. Remember the central theme and the problems of the book of Hebrews. The central theme of Hebrews is the superiority of Jesus Christ. The author is attempting to show the readers that Christ is superior to everything and everyone. He's the holy and exalted one. He is superior to the prophets. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to any great person they may have been putting their trust in. And he's our high priest forever, forever, representing us before the Father in heaven. And because Jesus is supreme, he's due all of our allegiance. Now the problem is, that many of the first century Hebrews, the Jewish people who are reading this, had become soft regarding the superiority of Jesus Christ. They had been 
become disillusioned and disoriented as a result of the, the persecution that they were going under. The, the church was under persecution. You remember that Nero, who was, who was uh, burning Christians alive and using them as torches for his, his festivals. And it was a horrible time. They were losing their jobs and their homes and, and their livelihood, their lives. And so they had, a lot of them, turned back to the traditional ties, uh, thinking, well, you know, at least if I can't be a Christian, and I don't want to be persecuted, and, and even their fellow Jews had, had disassociated themselves from them because they had left the ceremonial law, and, and so they, they reasoned, if we could at least, you know, become a part of a community, if we could, if we could get into a group that where we would be accepted, then maybe everything would be better. And so they were rejecting Christ, and they turned back to the Levitical priesthood, and the Mosaic law, and the Old Covenant, and the ceremonial sacrifices, and the ritual requirements. They turned back to all of that hmm, because they didn't like what was happening to them following Christ, and therefore were not recognizing Christ as superior. You see, that's what happens to us when we don't recognize Christ as superior. Other things come along, and they can easily distract us from him. It, when we don't make him the central focus of everything that we do and who we are and, and, and our life, we are easily distracted to other things thinking that that really is easier or that is more satisfying or whatever. We become distracted. People today are disillusioned. They're disoriented just like they were in the, in the first century. Are, are we not? Especially in the day in which we live. We're, we're asking the question, what's going on in our world? Has God forgotten about us? We've been deceived by the world. We don't think that we need God. We've been delivered a bill of goods that God isn't for us, but against us. And so we're disillusioned. Many people today are disillusioned. And the writer of Hebrews He's trying to bring them back. He's saying, you need to stop. You need to stop that faulty thinking. You need to come back to the truth. And so he's been, so he's been painting this picture of, of why Jesus is superior to the prophets and to the angels and even to the law. Jesus is the answer to all their problems. And with the coming of Jesus, a new era has begun. And it eclipses the old covenant traditions. And it, it eclipses the, the Judaic uh, uh, philosophies and laws. And Judaism has been left behind. Now, I want you to look at how the author uses that Jewish background as a reference to point Jesus to them as their only hope. Now this gets a little bit um, theological in nature. It, it, you're going to have to sort of think through me with this with me. Uh, you, you might have a tendency to think, wow, that's just really dry theology. But, but I want to point I want to point to uh, at the end why this is so, so important to understand. The point of reference that the author is looking to is Melchizedek. Now remember that we've already been introduced to this guy a couple of different times, right? Back in chapter 5 and verse 16, or verse 6 rather, and then in chapter 5 and verse 10, and then over in chapter 6 and verse 20. But, but the author just kind of lit on, on the subject. He didn't go deep into it because remember back in chapter 5 and verse 6, he, he stopped and he goes, you know, I've got a lot more I'd like to tell you guys about this. I, I want to talk more about this subject, but you're just too immature. And some of you, you're resisting Christ and you've backed away and you're not listening. So now I have to explain some other things to you to catch you up, get to you to, you to a point where you can really understand what I want to tell you about Melchizedek. He did all of that 
And now in chapter 7, he says, now let me tell you some more stuff. Remember that there's a close relationship between Jesus and Melchizedek. Sometimes it's hard to discern the significance because we live, like I said, in such a different world than, than the original readers did. And that's why we need to somehow find a bridge between the gap as we look in chapter 7. And I'm going to try to help you to do that. We're going to begin by reading verses 1 to 10. And then let's talk about it. Begin chapter 7 verse 1. For this reason Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, made, met, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises." It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, one by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Wow, talk about a foreign language, right? You're going, what in the world is he talking about? Well, let's try to unravel the knot. <clears throat> There's a lot of conjecture about who Melchizedek was. The bottom line is that I just got to be honest, we, we don't know a lot of the details about Melchizedek because the scripture does not give us a whole lot to go on. What is remarkable about his account is that his story gives us proof uh, of the divine inspiration and unity of the Bible. Let's think about this for a minute. We only have three verses in the book of Genesis that talk about Melchizedek. And yet, some 1,000 years later, King David makes a briefer mention of him over in Psalm 110 verse 4, declaring that the Messiah's priesthood would be like Melchizedek's. And then you journey another thousand years, and the writer of Hebrews reveals things about Melchizedek that even Melchizedek or his contemporary Abraham didn't know, and of which David only had glimpses of. <laughs> And so we see the same God who wrote Hebrews also wrote the Psalms and he also wrote Genesis thousands of years between. Do you see the, the unifying principle of Scripture? One author, God himself. Now, from these verses, we discover a little bit more about who Melchizedek was. Number one, we've discovered that he's the king of Salem which was in the region that we know today as Jerusalem. So he was the king of Jerusalem. Now, we don't know anything about his pedigree, his background. Even from Genesis chapter 4, where we have these three verses that talk about him, 18 to 20, we don't know anything about his parents or his ancestry or his birth or his death. It's a mystery. It's, he, he seems to reign, carry on his priestly functions without beginning or end. And I think God intended it for it to be that way. He didn't tell us a whole lot about this guy. Who, by the way, is not just a story. It's, not just a, it's just not an illustration somebody made up. He was a real man who, who, who was a real king, who was, was a real priest, who really reigned. <laughs> 
And yet God left him as a mystery because of the connection between him and Jesus. He's a fitting type of Christ. And so God left all this mystery because he wanted him to become a type of Christ. He was a great man. We see several things about him in Hebrews that points to that. And number one, he's a great man because he collected tithes from Abraham. Now, Melchizedek is mysterious, and we don't know a lot about him, but think about that. He collected a tithe from Abraham. Now, Melchizedek never went to war with Abraham, and he never served as Abraham's priest. But Abraham simply recognized him as superior to, to himself, as God's priest, and he gave him a tithe. And the less always blesses the greater. And secondly, we see that he blessed Abraham. The very one who, who had the promises from God and was great in his own, in his own right, Abraham, Melchizedek blessed him. Now, we have no idea how, how, much, how well Melchizedek knew Abraham, and we have no idea how well Abraham knew Melchizedek, but just as Abraham knew that he should tithe to Melchizedek, Melchizedek knew that he should bless Abraham. And as the blesser, Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. So he's a great man. And finally, from verses 8 to 10, he, we discover that he lives on. Like, his priesthood never ended, unlike the Levitical priesthood. It, you see, the, Le, the, the Levitical priesthood had ended. Levitical priests, they retired when they were age 50. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Retire at 50. And even if they had not had retired, um, well, they would have died, <laughs> ending their priesthood. You see, the Levitical priesthood had, a, had an end. It had a beginning, it had an end. It was a temporary thing. And the picture is that the priesthood of Melchizedek is, is eternal. Why? Because he never died. At least scripture, that's the picture it paints. He never died. Which shows us that his priesthood is greater than that of Aaron's priesthood. That's significant. Hang on to that point for a minute. Why was it necessary for the author to tell the listeners all of that information? Well, because they were, they were starting to trust again in the Levitical priesthood. They were going back to the law, to the ceremonies. That was their security. That was their stability. And, and the writer says, now wait a minute, stop it, stop. There's another priestly order that is superior to that of Aaron's. And it was the priesthood of Melchizedek, a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he, <clears throat> he further explains this truth by contrasting Jesus with Moses or the Old Covenant. <clears throat> so he says, okay, you guys want to go back to the Old Covenant? Let me show you. Let, 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 let me just paint the picture for you and show you why this, this is not the right way to go and why Melchizedek, the priest of Melchizedek, which Jesus is a part of, is superior to that. Look at verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law of what as well. For the one whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For... It is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Oh, talk about a foreign language. You see, the Levitical priesthood, let me try to unravel that. The Levitical priesthood is, is bound to the law. 
But there was another type of priesthood that existed even before the law. <laughs> you see, even before Moses climbed the mountain and God gave him the law on the mountain, there existed another priesthood that foreshadowed the, this priesthood. It, was, it foreshadowed the priesthood of Christ, which was the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now, God's ultimate de desire, of course, for mankind is for us to be brought into the presence of God uh, through, through faith, by salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, Aaron's priests, they could never do that. Aaron's priesthood could never bring man fully into the presence of God. Why? Because there was a barrier between, which was the veil in the temple which separated man from God. And so man could never enter into the presence of God. Why? Because the Bible says that sin separates us from God. And in the Garden of Eden, when man initially sinned, God separated them from him. He, he took them out of the garden and put a guard there, and they could never enter in again. And in the same way, the veil was put into the temple to keep man from the presence of God because, because sinful man can never enter into a presence of a holy God. We would be consumed immediately if that happened. And so we were separated. Remember on the, um, on, the, on the Mount Sinai when Moses went up to the mountain, he said, keep the people away. Don't allow them to come near the mountain or they'll be consumed. Man cannot enter into the presence of God because of sin. The veil couldn't be removed. Sin had not been paid for yet. But God never intended for the Levitical priesthood to last forever because if the ironic priesthood was perfect scripture said we just read it another one wouldn't have been needed we wouldn't have needed that one the ironic priesthood could never fully bring man into complete access with god now, I want you to notice in verse 14 that it says that Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah. Now, that should have caught your eye because the Levitical priesthood was from the tribe of Levi, Aaron. The significance of that is that Jesus stood outside of the legal heritage for a priest of the Old Covenant. He was not of the tribe of Levi, <laughs> Which means that his priesthood was of a completely different order. Verse 12 talks about the change that took place. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. And that word change means to put one thing on in replacement of another. You come home from work, your clothes are dirty, you take them off, you put on another set of clothes. It's a change. Christianity replaces Judaism. The order of Melchizedek replaces Aaron's priesthood, and now the Old Testament law is completely obsolete. Now, God's moral law remains intact. I mean, what's reflected in the Ten Commandments? We, we still abide by the law, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not covet, do not bear false witness, do not use God's vain, name in vain, etc. We, we abide by those laws, but the ceremonial law, the ironic system of sacrifices, they've been, all set, they set, they've been set aside. And so the Jews no longer had to go to the temple in order to worship because the veil had been torn. When Christ died on Calvary's cross, the veil was rent in two. Why? God provided, Jesus, through his blood, provided access for man, anytime, anywhere, to come into the presence of God. The rituals were all gone. That's why we can worship God today virtually as, as the body of Christ. Because we can all come into the very presence of God at the same time. We don't need to be in a place. Now, we're, we, it's good to be in a place. The, body, the Bible says we need to gather together. In fact, Hebrews talks about that over in chapter 10. We need to be together. And we'll be back together at some point. But regardless of that, we can worship God like this. 
because the veil in the temple has been torn. And there, there were some Judaizers, however, who were trying to convince uh, some of the new Jewish Christians that, um, you know, they had to still practice certain laws to be saved, like the rite of circumcision, but, but, but that was all gone. You see, Jesus rose from the dead, and it was all exchanged to a new order, a new priest, a new sacrifice, a new system, a new covenant. In fact, even the day of Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday. We're, it's, we call it the Lord's Day because that's it's when Jesus rose from the dead. From the beginning to the end, the Levitical priesthood was built around physical things, right? The priest who came into the presence of God, he could have no blemishes. You know, if he got a pimple that day, he couldn't go in. <laughs> no blemishes. He, he was sharpening his knife and, uh, you know, he's cut his hand and got a scar. Mm. You, you couldn't go in. No blemishes. He had to be, wow, they must have been, you know, really handsome men who went into the presence of God. No blemishes. Um, and so, that's all gone. Christianity replaced that. On the day of the ordination of the priest, he had to be bathed and clothed and anointed. There was only one place where the sacrifice could be offered. Only one high priest could enter behind the veil. But the new priesthood is built on an indestructible life. Now, now you say, well, wow, that was kind of heavy. Where's the point of all of that? What are you trying to say to me? What, what difference does that make in my life? You know, I was never in, the, in, you know, in that system. Why, why does that make a difference to me? Because Jesus provided us with a way to have access to God. It was through the priesthood of Jesus, of the priesthood of Melchizedek, that now we have access to the throne room of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Didn't have that before. Every believer is anointed as a priest unto the Lord. <laughs> Every believer. We're not washed by human hands, but, but we're washed by the Spirit of God through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. We don't just worship God in church, but we can worship him anywhere because we are now the temple of the living God who dwells in us. You see, that's the difference it made. That we now have access through Jesus Christ. We could spend a whole month or more just on this chapter, but let's conclude by looking at the comparison the writer makes between the two covenants very quickly. Verse 18 for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced. Grab that line, a better hope is introduced. Through which we draw near to God. A better hope through which we draw near to God. Verse 18 says that Jesus uprooted the law in that it didn't produce any fruit in the, in the believer. But verse 19 says that in its place he planted grace, which blossoms with hope. We, now we have hope. The law was both weak and ineffective, but grace is effective and it's filled with assurance. And remember, it's grace, not law, that allows us to enter into the presence of God. We're not saved by our good works. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus who gave his life for us to pay the penalty for our sin. Are you glad you don't need a priestly pedigree or, or some kind of ceremonial cleansing to come into the presence of God? The cleansing we need is the blood of Jesus that saves us from all our sin. That's the cleansing we need. And we get that through placing our faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Savior, the Messiah of the world. 
we, we get that cleansing of the Spirit as the Spirit comes and washes our hearts and makes it white as snow. For all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to be placed on him. And because of that, when, when we reach up our hand like a beggar reaching his hand to receive a gift from a king, he offers us this free gift of eternal life through his cleansing blood. And if you've never done so today, I'm asking that you will trust Jesus as your personal Savior. That you'll ask, ask him into your life. Stop being deceived by the world. Stop turning to your own ways. Stop thinking that you can be, be, become somehow good enough. Stop thinking that there maybe is no God. Trust him as your savior and let him cleanse you. Let him make you whole and al allow him to give you access into the very throne room of God. You can do that right now as we pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that if there's somebody today listening that has never trusted Jesus as their Savior, that Lord, because of, of who he is and because of what he has accomplished and because he's superior, Lord, to man, to us, to anything else, that Lord, they'll trust him and allow him to bring them this great hope of salvation. You can just say a prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm separated from you because of my sin. Come into my heart. Make me a new person. Make me a child of God and help me to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said a prayer like that, Welcome to the family of God, if you sincerely believed it. And if you said a prayer like that, uh, give a, drop us a line. Let us know so that we can be an encouraged and so that we can encourage you in turn in your new walk with Christ. Thank you for joining our broadcast today of Hope of Glory, presented by North Broadway Baptist Church in Tilsonburg. If you have any prayer requests or would like to get in contact with us, you can email us at northbroadwaychurch at gmail.com or give us a call at 519-688-5959. To find out more information about us, you can check out our website at northbroadwaychurch.ca or check out our Facebook page. To keep up to date on past episodes of Hope of Glory, you can also find us on YouTube at North Broadway Baptist Church, Tilsonburg. From all the staff, and members, thank you, and we'll see you again next week.